Hi, welcome. My name's Andy Prosser, the founder and CEO of The Executive Technologist. I'm here today talking to uh, Prosper about um, technology and all the, the sh bright, shiny objects we're seeing out there and what you can do about it. How you can actually leverage all of these cool new toys and technology and not go insane in the process. Now, hopefully, you'll be able to build a stronger, faster, more effective business that allows you to grow and reach your goals. Now, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show, where we bring you interviews with experts, thought leaders from various industries that are changing the game. Now, in today's episode, we're joined by Andy Prosser, who's the founder and CEO of the Executive Technologies, who has spent nearly 30 years working with technology in both large and small organizations. Now, Andy, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Prosper. It's great to be here, buddy. Fantastic. Well, I've been looking at some of the stuff that you've been doing and, um, you know, your heavy involvement in, you know, uh, helping people adopt the Microsoft platform, but I'll let you, um, you know, get into that. So for those that are watching right now, Andy is a tech expert who has a passion for breaking down complex technological concepts into more accessible language for a broader audience. Now, in this episode, we're going to be discussing how small to medium businesses can actually leverage technology to improve their businesses. And Andy is going to be sharing his insights on systemizing your business, using interactive media, um, leveraging tech to solve what he calls the 1000 pepper cuts. He's going to be empowering your team to leverage technology in interesting ways and a lot more. So stay tuned and let's dive into the world of technology with Andy Prosser. Now, Andy, how did you get involved in all this um, technology stuff? I kind of um, was going in a different direction. Um, you know, I, I grew up on a small farm in regional Western Australia and uh, and then, um, you know, like all kids do who grow up on farms, they go to a private school for boarding school and all that sort of stuff. But at the same time, my parents decided they wanted to go their separate ways. And dad, after being years as a farmer, decided, hey, I'm going to go and learn computer science, as you do. Um, so when he started, when I'm starting high school, he's starting university again. Um, so, you know, I sort of got into technology and all that sort of stuff. But ironically, um, the three options I put down for when I graduated high school, I got my third pick, which happened to be just a random one I threw on there because a mate said it would be a good idea. So next thing I know, I'm landing in Kalgoorlie. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. That's when you started digging holes and blowing shit up, right? Pretty much, yeah. That's a that's a uh, a more colloquial way of saying I learned uh, mining engineering, right? <laughs> it literally was that. It was you know, especially if you've seen Kogoli, there's this massive pit, this hole in the ground right next to the town that's hundreds of meters deep and kilometers long, etc. Where they're mining gold and all that sort of stuff. And literally, you know, you have to learn you know geology and explosives. Explosives is fun, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> dangerous stuff i've still got all my fingers so i i did okay absolutely no um, but what happened there when i was there is that the the university where i was of the college i was staying at um someone handed me a um a copy of microsoft access version one i'm dating myself um and said oh look we're trying to manage our students and we were going to get the computer um guy in the university to do this Someone told me, you know a little bit about computers. You want to have a look? And down the rabbit hole I went. Fantastic. Now, obviously, you kept investigating, and I think this has become a passion of yours. Can you tell us about your journey now in the tech industry, you know, transitioning from digging holes and how you actually founded the executive technologies? Yeah, so um, I've had more jobs than I probably should admit to. I went through so many different industries, but it was always this, you know, um, in every role, it was always about pushing the boundaries. You know, anytime there was something new um, that the organization was trying to investigate, they'd just throw it at me. They'd say, we don't know how to spell this. Can you go work it out? Um, so... You know, I, I um, ended up working in R&D for Ericsson, 
um, on some of the technologies that we take for granted today, I was working on 20 years ago. You know, this, this idea of getting a status to see when someone's available online that we see with, you know, Slack and um, Teams, we were doing 20 years ago. Um, web chat, 20 years ago, doing all of that sort of stuff. Um, and then over, over the years, ended up um, getting in more and more senior roles, doing product development for Optus for a while, um, until they had their usual um, management consultants come in and just sort of clear house every six months as they do. Uh, and then found myself at a loose end going, okay, so I've been doing this. So I seem to be pushed and moved around forever else. Didn't really like the way the consulting industry looked and thought, I'll go and start my own company and do better than that. How hard could it possibly be? <laughs> Anyone who started a business knows never to ask that question. Absolutely. Well, there's a lot that gets involved um, besides, um, you know, like you say, digging holes and blowing shit up and stuff does get explosive when you start a business. Now, you seem to have worked with both large and small organizations. Well, what sort yes. of differences have you noticed in their approach to using technology? Look, one of the thing, biggest things, and I think cloud you know, with the likes of Amazon and AWS and all that sort of stuff coming in, and even Microsoft and Apple and everyone else involved. What's happened is that the technologies that we have access to today were the sorts of stuff that 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, you needed an enterprise size budget to get access to. The stuff that you see baked into both uh, Google G Suite or whatever they're calling it now, I think it's Workspace, um, and Microsoft 365, the technology that's baked into both those platforms used to require budgets of multi-millions of dollars just to stand up to even get 10% of the capacity. And then it would take you millions of dollars to operate that. Now, if you can afford a cup of coffee a week, you can get access to this stuff. You can get access to mind-bending capabilities. And anyone who's been paying attention just last week to Microsoft's sort of announcement around Copilot, which is taking what we're seeing going on in chat GDP and all of that cool stuff, now being applied to your internal content and be able to create content based on the knowledge in your business. And that's going to be accessible to everyone. This is just incredible. So what I saw is that this world was no longer the the stomping ground or the exclusive access to the enterprise. But there was no one in small business teaching people, coaching them, guiding them, giving them an idea of what is possible so that they can actually create something cool. And I liken it to, um, you know, you've gone and built your own house, right? You've spent millions of dollars. Nowadays it is millions of dollars, but it used to be thousands of dollars, right? Not so long ago. That's another conversation. Um, so you build this uh, house, but there's no gardens, no floor coverings, no window coverings, no furniture, no soul. It's an empty shell. And when you get Google Workspace or Microsoft 365 or any other platform for that matter, and that's what you're faced with. But there was no one there unless you had an enterprise budget to show you how. Hence, the executive um, technologist was born to create that executive level and the enterprise level viewpoint and goals and aspirations of automated setup and guidance that the big end of town gets, but it's designed for the cash flow of a smaller, smaller growing business. Absolutely. While you were talking, I was actually just thinking, you know, I grew up watching Oprah and how she would have all these interviews fly people from across the world and everything else. And I'm just thinking right now, I've spent zero dollars to have you on my show today. I haven't flown you anywhere. We're talking on Zoom. The technology has just made it super simple. We were, um, you know, talking about all the other different technologies there and everything is now at our fingertips. But I also suppose that really 
brings about a lot of challenges because with um, abundance and a lot of stuff, like we likened this whole thing to people drinking from a fire hose. What are okay. some of the common challenges that small to medium business owners are now facing when it actually comes to this abundance of technology and how can they actually overcome it? Um, the two things, the shiny syndrome, um, a shiny object syndrome. Basically, you know, everyone's talking about chat GDP and how cool it is and the people <laughs> are building businesses on it, right? Um, but they're forgetting about some of the fundamentals, right? Um, if your cybersecurity practices and your um, basic structure within your business, even your business strategy and business plans are up the daft, I don't care how good you are at asking chat GDP to do stuff, your business is going to fail, right? There's some solid foundational things that a lot of organizations, because of that shiny object syndrome, they're going, they're building their um, penthouse with the skyhooks um, and hoping it will stay up there. Absolutely. Right. So that's that's one aspect. Um, the other thing is the um <clears throat> I actually forgot my train of thought on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean obviously shiny object, right? It's a shiny object, it's very distracting. <laughs> So many things are happening all at the same time. And if you haven't got a good foundation, you obviously are not going to capitalize uh, on the technology that we're using. And I, that, I concur with that. Um, even, that. Even though we are exposed to all this technology, I was giving you that example of how when we got the calculator um you know introduced <laughs> to us what i used to do as an eight-year-old was to type in eight zero zero eight five i'll let you figure that out and um, that was my use of a calculator whereas in other parts of the world they were actually using the same instrument to fly a man to the moon all right see i'm yeah. also dating myself there but obviously in, in not, not exactly the same use case but um you know there's so many uses to technology that uh any person who's not well grounded or focused um to where they want to go can actually start utilizing now you see so, I, I just remembered i just remembered what i was going to say yes. um so the thigh hose analogy the yes. other one total and utter overwhelm if you're not a tech person and you're, you're trying to run a business and you're just being hit with this fire hose that's hit you and now you're overwhelmed with all this information and you're thinking, I need to become tech savvy. I need to use this tech. I need to use this tech. I'm going to be left behind. Right. It's that 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 fear, you know, the old monkey on the back. I'm not good enough. I don't deserve to be here because I don't understand this world. Yeah, so I see people like myself as being out there trying to help guide people and reduce that overwhelm. Just say, hey, look, okay, it's good. It's okay to be freaking the hell out. But Absolutely. here's some simple strategies and steps that you can take to try to manage this to help you grow, expand, and deliver the outcomes that you're a genius at doing for your customers. Absolutely. I've also heard in some instances where there's a bit of a big resist when it comes to technology oh. a, 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 a adoption in as much as a lot of the team members or the employees are afraid that they would be replaced if they actually adopt whatever technology is um, there. So it's just a matter of survival for them to start resisting this um, tech. Now, my question now is how can businesses empower their teams to actually start leveraging this technology in interesting ways and what sort of benefits can they expect to see if they help um, you know, their, their, their teams to actually adopt this technology that they're using? You, you touched on a, a good point um, there. So in the enterprise IT departments I came from, they used to become known as the Department of No. Any new tech would come along, it would be, no, we're not bringing that in. No, 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 no. So they would resist. And then we had this rise of shadow IT, which is if you're working in enterprise, well, I've got a credit card and I've got a, um, you know, or I can go and sign up to this free service. ID department says that will take six years to build. I can get that in 10 minutes. Thanks very much. And they go around. Um, and so that's what sort of caused that in the enterprise space. In um, smaller business, or in fact, any in any size business, really, 
the most important as asset that you have is your employees. So, and especially the younger employees, um, you know, younger than us two, right? Um, you know, the, the new generation that's coming through, you know, uh, my generation is described as the, the digital tourists. We've come into this digital world um, like tourists going through and exploring a new world, like travel to Rome and you're wandering around like a doe-eyed tourist, don't know, don't speak the language, don't understand what the hell is going on, and you just go to all the frequent hotspots that everyone else says you should go visit. The um the digital um you know the, the digital natives, they know where all the places are. They grew up in this environment, they know how to navigate everything. So it's about leveraging that but also tempering it with the experience of the other generations and mixing those together the importance here is giving your team time to explore give your team the ability to go and make change but not one change you talked about the thousand paper cuts right and that's my favorite little topic it's not about making big change it's about looking at solving the little ones the ones that have the impact of a single paper cut and they do that a thousand times. Absolutely. I like that. I like, was it Bruce uh, Lee that says, I'm not afraid of the person who's learned one kick, um, you know, 10,000 kicks once. I'm afraid of the person who's learned one kick 10,000 times. So that could be in, in conjunction with what it is that you're talking about there. No, you know, we could go on and on, but how important really um, is it, especially I like how you say we are all um, exploring this whole, you know, you know, technological universe. I'm going to call you and me Internet Explorers uh, since <laughs> Microsoft sunsetted that, right? So you and me are now Internet Explorers. But how important is it for businesses to sort of keep up with the latest technology trends? And what are some of the current trends that you're really excited about? The thing is, I'm really excited about what where AI is going to go. Let's let's call the elephant in the room, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Microsoft uh, had a flashy presentation. I much must have watched it about five times over the weekend right. about what they're doing with Copal. Every time I watched through that, I picked up some new nuance and stuff. Now, the thing is, is that tech isn't quite here yet. They announced it to say that it's coming. They're testing it internally. They're testing it with um, select customers, but it won't be long. Um, the speed that this stuff is coming along is just blowing minds left, right, and center, right? Um, it reminds me of a movie where everyone's heads were popping, but that's another <laughs> digress, right? That's literally what's happening. So AI is one of those tech, but... What it's doing is it's, it's large language models and stuff. That's how it works. It's sort of analyzing information and it's using immense resources to compute all of this stuff. You know, all the resources that Bitcoin was using, this thing's using more um, to be able to do all of this, to be able to create this, this content. The, but there'll be something else coming along after that. You know, how long before, and I keep waiting for a heads up displays on my glasses because I can't remember names or what someone does. I get people come up to me in a crowd. I don't know who the hell they are. They say, Andy, Andy, been really, um, and this actually happened to me a couple of weeks ago, been waiting to meet you. I'm so glad to see, meet you in person. Been fantastic. I'm going, I have no freaking I idea, no who, idea you are. who you are. <laughs> no clue. No clue at all. Um, heads up display would be cool because it would go and then uh, use AI and machine learning, et cetera, to go into my LinkedIn database and go, oh, I, I, facial recognition, that's who it is, and stick their name and what they do and where I met them. You know, that could be something that's coming along um, now uh, or in the near future. The point being is that change is going to be inevitable. And the rate of change that we're seeing has been faster than any other time in human history. So as a business owner, what you need to ask is, how does this change affect my business? Can I leverage it? Is it something I need to be able to combat? So if you're a copywriter, guess what you're going to be doing? You're going to be looking at ways to either leverage ChatGDP or fight against it, fight or flight, right? 
So you're going to sort of look at that and saying, well, okay, I can get ChatGPT to write the core content, the starter of my um, topic, or I can use, you know, some of the stuff that Microsoft showcased with Copilot of saying, can you shorten that text for me? Can you abbreviate that? You know, who was it? Mark Twain who said, I didn't have enough time to be brief. So here's a long letter. Yep. <laughs> right. It takes time to be brief. I know I suffer from that a lot. <laughs> so it's not um, about what's coming next. It's about what are you going to do about it? What have you done to prepare your business for that change? Do you have good, solid foundations within your business that all the basic stuff's done? You don't have to worry about where you're storing your files, how you're managing security, how you're tagging things for sensitivity, how you're protecting your business, but then also how you're baking in a culture of change. The thousand paper cuts is important there because it's encouraging you to change one thing every day, change one thing and get used to continuously changing so you don't slam up against this big wall of inertia that's 500 feet high because you've done nothing and suddenly you have to go, oh, I have to work out how to do this change thing again. Oh, muscles don't want to do it. You know, it's like going to the gym for the first time after five years. You go there the first time and you think, oh, I'll just go straight into it, smash out, you know, five sets. <laughs> Chances are you can't walk for a week, right? Because you're not yeah. used to it. You haven't trained yourself. So we need to train ourselves and our businesses and our teams to work with change every day I, and I, I, understand I, what how it influences it. I so like the reference that you made about, um, you know, the copywriters, either they're going to be fighting it or, um, you know, flighting, flying with it. Um, it's like uh, the time when, you know, uh, Henry Ford introduced the, the, the T-Mobile. Model T. The Model T. I always <laughs> get that mixed up <laughs> with the Model T. And, um, you know, everybody with a thousand horses, you know, was putting sand in the T-Mobile engines just because they just didn't want to face change and um, and things of that nature. So I, I really like how you're helping these, um, you know, people really put it into perspective what it is that they're supposed to, to be doing. So how then do you yourself sort of stay up to date with all these latest technology trends and developments and what sort of resources do you recommend for small to medium businesses to, to be able to do the same? Because like you say, change is coming and they need to stay abreast, um, you know, everything else that's happening so they don't get rolled over by Look, one of the biggest ones is to find other voices, right? You know, I follow a lot of people on LinkedIn that are part of the industries and technology spaces, et cetera. You know, some are direct competitors to me, but I still follow them and I share tips with them and they share vice versa. But it's about finding that community uh, of like-minded people that are sharing this information and, you know, some of the early adopters who can then start, you know, showing you what's possible. Um, it's hard, right? It takes a lot of time. You know, you can read books about it, but remember a book is going to be um, a view that was written some time ago by the time it gets to your, into your hands. You know, there, there's Twitter, there's all the various social media and all of that sort of stuff. But it's trying to avoid the, the hype echo chambers, right? It's very easy to get sucked into those vortex where everyone is like-minded. They're all saying and singing from the same hymn, hymn sheet and saying that this is the best thing sliced slice bread. There's a couple of texts out there that I can think of that have fallen prey to that hype, right? They're still struggling for relevance in, in the world. Um, I'm not going to name them. Um, you'll all probably have different ones where you've seen. You're saying, hey, this is going to be the next best thing. Keep an eye on that. You know, early on in AI, I thought this is just going to be another flash in the pan type thing. We're still in the hype cycle. Yep. We've got to realize that we're still going up on this hype. It's going to come crashing back down when we have this realization of how it actually works in everyday life. Same with these bloody things. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. If you walk outside your front door today and you don't have that in your pocket, how naked do you feel? <laughs> so, you know, so talking about, you know, technology and how things have sort of changed when, um, when WhatsApp first came on the scene, I was just like, yeah, it's yet another fade, fade or phase, 
nobody's going to adopt it. Nobody really cares about encrypted messages and things of that nature. But, you know, um, in the third world, it has become the main basis of communication. And um, even even my grandma sends me a WhatsApp message once in a while asking about the grandkids. So you can see the level of it having been adopted. You know, it takes time, but it does come around. Now, it leads me to my question. Do you know of any sort of technology since you've worked with companies like Ericsson, you've worked with Optus and all of those, um, you know, big uh, market leaders or industry leaders, you know, do you know of any sort of technology or any solution that you may personally have initially dismissed or the market initially dismissed, but later it actually changed their mind around it. And um, if you can tell us what actually made you change your perspective, the reason why I'm asking this is because some people might actually be dismissing chat GPT as irrelevant to the, you know, their workflow and what they're doing, but they might actually be missing on the band, uh, you know, on jumping on to actually learn how to use it for their best, um, you know, interest. Look, there's a lot of technologies that are, are like that. You know, you, you you made the reference around um, Henry Ford's Model T, right? And that everyone was trying to sandbag it, um, quite literally trying to stop its innovations. Yes. When um, cloud computing first emerged because Amazon had a spare capacity within their data centers when they weren't running their, their uh, book sales over Christmas, then they thought, well, we can sell this stuff, right? Um, everyone at the time had their um, data centers or their broom closets full of servers when they had everything in there. So why would we want to move this out of our out of our server rooms? You know, they eventually moved it into a data center somewhere else that someone else was managing it, and then everything got virtualized, and now it's all up in this this cloud infrastructure. The same sort of thing, video chat, right? Video chat that we just suddenly um, are using everywhere didn't think we was being dismissed. Um, even the ability to be able to work from home until COVID forced the issue. And here's the fascinating thing about that. The technology was all there, ready to go. It was business and business decision makers and leaders that were blocking it because they're saying, I need you in a room. I need to see you working. You can't possibly work from home. Yet when we were forced to work from home because uh, COVID shut down borders and restricted movements and basically said you have to stay isolated from home to try to stop the spread of this, within two weeks, two weeks, some of the biggest organisations on the planet had switched to a full working from home model. Absolutely. Two weeks. That tells me that the technology is there. In most cases, it's not the technology that's the blocker. It's not the technology that's the influencer here. It's the interface between the keyboard and the chair, the wetware, if you like, right? <laughs> not the hardware, not the software, the wetware. But the wetware. <laughs> it's the wetware that can't keep up with all of this sort of stuff. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, well, you see, that actually drives us home now with um the work that you do because as you mentioned you know you're working with um you know small to medium businesses to adopt the use of microsoft 365 and a lot of people have not really um you know sort of really seen the full extent of what this uh, technology can possibly do for their business. Now, can you just tell us a little bit about your Microsoft 365 uh, coaching and uh, adoption sort of services and how they can actually benefit a business? Yeah, so one of the things that we find um, with 365 is that most people, when they think of Microsoft 365 or Microsoft Office, they think about the desktop apps, right? Word, Excel, PowerPoint, you know, those sorts of things, Outlook um, on their on their PC. And that's, and, and then they at first will admit that, look, I don't even know how to use more than 10% of the capability there. But when you look at the whole ecosystem, that's about 1%, maybe a bit more, right, of the whole platform, the whole story. There's so much other stuff that's in the cloud, that's in Microsoft's data centers that allows and powers those tools. These are just windows into that world. 
that's all they are. They're just windows into that world, which is an interesting thing because they call windows. Microsoft Windows, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a window into the world of, of everything else, right? So what we find within um, what we do is that a lot of organizations, I refer back to the, the idea of getting that brand new home. It's empty. There's no soul in it, nothing in there. So an organization, they get their software licenses to get access to 365. It's set up and they've effectively walked into a home with no window treatment, no floor coverings, no furniture, no garden, no soul. It's just empty shell, right? So they have to build all of this stuff. There's a lot of mod cons. There's a, a lot of the appliances, all the, you know, all the gadgetry that you would ever want to think of, but you need to work out how to leverage that, right? So imagine it's a smart home wired for sound. It's got all the bits, but someone needs to show you how to use the darn controls to make it work. Absolutely. <laughs> right. So that's what we do. We help people understand that. And what we've found is that most organizations, big or small on the planet, are using less than 5% of the capability of this platform. My mission is to help change that so you can be exposed and understand the rest of the other 95%. So it works in a couple of ways. Number one, going to save you time because we're going to find ways using the system to save you time. Right. The other thing it's going to do is save you money. The amount of times we've come across organizations that have spent good money on other systems that they already had access to within 365. So instead of spending a thousand dollars extra a month over here, stop spending that money and put it over into this system. That thousand dollars goes back every month back to your business to be used for marketing, sales profit, whatever you need it for, hiring another person, potential thousand dollars, probably not quite enough. Um, but the point is, is that it's about exposing people to what's possible. You can do quizzes. You've got an online booking system in there. You can create forms to collect data. You can automate all of this sort of stuff. You can build applications using the side project of power platform, and you can even use AI to ask it to build me a system that does all this and it will go and create it for you. Low code or no code, basically just, hey, computer, go and construct this for me. Sweet. You know, Star Trek style, right? So it, it's about showing people what's possible. A, a, a new customer just the other day, she's a solopreneur, um, was just using email through um, her website. I spent 30 minutes with her and just showed her what's possible. And she's like, I had no idea. Absolutely no idea any of that existed. So half of my time is just going, well, let me show you what's possible. Let me lift up and open up Pandora's box and let's have a peek inside. Absolutely. And what would be and the then helping people go and, and explore that, giving them a safe place, and then empowering them. My biggest moments are when my clients come back to me and say, you know that thing you, sh you showed me the other day, you know, how to build a system hub, for example? Look what I created. Wow. That's beautiful. Absolutely. Now, what would be the best way now, Andy, for people to come and uh, open their Pandora's box with you? Um, well, first off, if you Google my name, I'm every every person on that, uh, every hit on the front page, except the actor. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, look, find me on LinkedIn, et cetera, is an easy way. So Google my name, find me on LinkedIn, reach out, say good day. Um, that's an easy way for people to get to know me. Um, I share a lot of content on LinkedIn. I'm doing a lot of videos and and I, I take some of the insights that I see with others and share theirs to amplify their messages as well. So, you know, that's a good way to learn about who this crazy cat is. Absolutely. Well, we've learned quite a lot from you and I still have more and more questions to go, but uh, obviously in the interest of time and I, I just got a, a nod from our producers that we're running out of tape. I just wanted to ask you one last question. Now, what sort of advice would you give to a small to medium business owner who is looking to improve their use for technology and actually grow their business, but without tearing their hair out um, in the process? Yeah, you don't want my hairline. <laughs> um, yeah, I beat you to that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we have to call the elephant in the room. Um, 
The simple thing is, is that, you know, be aware of that, you know, shiny object syndrome, be aware of that. That is still, it doesn't mean don't have a look. But the first thing is, is you have to really, as a business owner, just take a step back and have a look around at all the systems that you've got within your business today and ask yourself, how are they working together? Are they working well? Are they working consistently? Do you hear or see your team struggling? Do they take too long to deliver certain tasks? Are they swearing at their computer or are they actually turning their Windows computer and finding the closest window to throw it out, right? I often say and joke to people saying the best um, time to look for someone I can help is anyone who's swearing at their computer. Because it's not doing what you need it to do. It should be saving you time. It should be saving you money. It should be saving your sanity. If it's not doing those three things, then don't try bolting on something new because one of those is going to get sucked up. One of those is going to get lost. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Andy, I really appreciate your time. There's a lot we could have talked about your book, your journey, how you got from being Andrew to Andy. You know what that means now? We need to do another episode. <laughs> Sounds good, my friend. Fantastic. We're going to have like the pros the Prospa Prosa uh, series and we can talk tech. We can talk everything, um, parenthood and things of that nature. But for those that are watching right now, I think you've, um, you know, really grasped what it is that you need to do when it comes to technology. And that's really all on today's episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And I really hope you enjoyed our conversation with Andy Prosser, who is the founder and CEO of the Executive Technologies. And um, you, as you would have been watching, he really shared some great insights on how small to medium businesses can leverage technology to improve their business. Now, if you've got any questions and comments, feel free to reach to any one of us. And as Andy has mentioned, you can look him up on um, Google or on LinkedIn. But don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and stay tuned for our next um, episode. And as Andy has promised us, he'll be doing another uh, part of this series with us. So stay tuned. Bye for now. Thank you.